life has ups and downs. As that saying goes, you never know what's going to happen in life. Bad things happen one after another, and there are plenty of hard times. But life can change so quickly over something so trivial. My name is Luke Smith. Just an ordinary office worker, I commute by train every day. But I was feeling nothing but melancholic. That's because my company is a small branch office with the headquarters in the prime area of downtown New York. And from today, a newcomer from the headquarters is moving to my place of work. This person is known to cause a lot of problems at the headquarters, but he is a relative of the CEO and cannot be fired. So he was reluctantly transferred, well, effectively demoted to our branch. It would make anyone feel down to hear that such a problem child will be assigned to my department. I have experience as a team leader, but it's really hard to work when there's someone who disrupts the flow. I just hope he's not on the same team as mine. With that thought, I am on a crowded train today as well. Well, it's better than being packed like a can of sardines, I guess. While thinking this, I had glanced several times at the crowd of people who, like me, were using the train, when suddenly, whoa, a certain woman caught my eye. Long, light brown hair and slightly heavy makeup. Wearing a cute checked miniskirt. Maybe she's a college student. She seemed to be a young woman. However, the hem of her miniskirt got caught on a large bear key chain on her back. And, well, you could see quite a lot. In other words, well, the skirt was no longer fulfilling its role, and the pink thing with a bear, like the keychain, was visible. She must really love bears. No, that's obviously bad. As expected, several passengers noticed, but no one could speak up. That's understandable. After all, most of the passengers are men. There are women, but not many around her, or if they are, they are too absorbed in their cell phones or books at hand to notice. It would take a lot of courage to suddenly tell a woman you don't know that her skirt is up. Oh boy, isn't this bad, as I looked around, sure enough. Hey, isn't that situation kinda wild? Two boys, about high school age, are grinning at her. She herself is engrossed in her cell phone and unaware and high school boys, who are in a sensitive time of their life and are still learning the norms, often make mistakes. One of the boys was pointing his cell phone towards her, and I thought this was something I could not ignore. But if I confront the high school boys, I might attract unnecessary attention. I wanted to resolve the situation peacefully, so I quickly took off the jacket I was wearing and draped it over her shoulders. I am taller so it just about covers the important pots. The woman was surprised and said, what, who? It's a natural reaction to be startled by a stranger suddenly draping a jacket over you. When I quietly pointed out to her in a whisper, your skirt is up. I thought it would be hard for you to fix it here. She finally grasped the situation and her face turned red. Oh my, that's embarrassing. Uh, I'll fix it at the next station. Wait, how much did you see? She was in a panic like this. Thinking this was not good, I got off the train at the next station with her. She seemed to feel awkward, and I wanted my jacket back, so I had no choice. Wow, I really appreciate it. You're super handsome. I want to thank you. Can you give me your contact info? I had thought so when I saw her miniskit, but this woman was rather flighty, or rather, a bit of a party girl. She came on strong, and while I was surprised, I had a meeting this morning, and when I looked at the clock, I was definitely late. I needed to get to work ASAP, so I handed her my business card and said, um, here, this is my business card. Contact me there if you need anything, and don't worry about thanking me, and hopped onto the express train that had just arrived at the station. I finally headed to work, but as expected, I was late for the meeting. Even though I had notified them in advance, I was called into the conference room by the manager. 
Luke, it's fine that you helped someone and were late, but bringing the wrong documents to a meeting is not okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I was late and in my rush, I mistakenly grabbed the wrong documents and, as a result, ended up embarrassing myself in the meeting. I was glad I was the only one who was embarrassed, but as one would expect, restless behavior is not good for a member of society. As I was apologizing to my department manager, the manager said, Well, what's done is done. Make sure it doesn't happen next time. Now, on to the real issue at hand. Saying that, my manager handed me a piece of paper. He's a kind man, and it's rare for him to call me into his office like this which means something significant must have happened. I accepted the paper he gave me and began to read. What? What's this? I'm really sorry about this. Starting today, I want you to train the new recruit, said my manager with an apologetic look on his face. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you serious? The new recruit is the CEO's relative who couldn't be managed at the headquarters, and I'm supposed to guide him. Why me? I asked. Well, the thing is, the headquarters specifically requested you today, he explained. What? I cried out, almost in a scream. I rarely go to the headquarters, and I haven't done anything noteworthy for the human resources at headquarters to remember my name. Despite having no achievements, why was I selected? As I was panicking over this baffling situation, banged. Suddenly the conference room door swung open and an agitated subordinate of the department manager rushed in. Sir, we've got a serious problem, he exclaimed. What's going on? I'm in a meeting with Luke right now, replied the manager. It's about the new recruit. The CEO of the headquarters wants to see you and Luke. What? This time it was the manager who cried out in surprise, while I was still trying to digest what was happening. What did he just say? I knew the new recruit was coming, but the CEO as well. What on earth is happening? The manager and I exchanged glances and hurried out of the conference room, heading for the reception room, knowing we couldn't keep the CEO waiting. And there we saw. Hey, it's you from earlier. Hi there, she greeted. It was the woman I'd helped on the train. And she was sitting next to the CEO. Oh, please, give me a break. What the heck is going on here? I was nearly in panic mode and decided to get my head out of the clouds here. As it turned out, the woman I helped today, whose name is Anna Ashton, is the CEO's daughter. But apparently she's been rather wild and has had difficulty sticking with any company she's joined. She still hasn't shaken off those bad habits, making it difficult for her to hold down a job anywhere. The CEO had hired her as an assistant, but he received criticism internally for being too lenient with his family member. So, the CEO decided to transfer her to a branch office as part of her real-world experience. I heard you helped my daughter on the train today. As a father, I thank you." The CEO said, bowing his head to me. This made me break out in a cold sweat for a whole different reason, but then I also learned why I had been chosen. When I handed Anna my business card, she realized we were from the same company, but she couldn't stop me because I was in a hurry. So she took a picture of the card and sent it to the CEO. And after checking with HR, they assumed that I, as a team leader, have some experience with employee development, so they entrusted their daughter to me. In other words, my act of kindness has led to this unexpected situation. The CEO likely wants me to cultivate his daughter and thus earn a promotion in the future, but from my perspective, I've just been saddled with a difficult new recruit. What should I do? but I had no choice. Nice to meet you, Luki, and it cheerfully greeted me with absolutely no trace of professionalism, leaving me no choice but to hang my head. And that's when my unbelievably busy days began.
Even the manager seemed to realize that this was going to be a tall order and told me to focus on training Anna for a while, handing off non-urgent tasks to others. Thanks to that, I was supposed to have some time. Well, that didn't happen. Anna, what on earth are you doing? What do you mean? I'm just hungry. Anna was snacking on a piece of chocolate while watching the training video, and I just had to sigh at the sight. If she's hungry, that's fine, but she could at least do it out of sight. Is she that clueless? But it wasn't that. Anna may not have great social skills, but she's not stupid. As proof, she managed to remember how to do simple tasks after being shown just once. Oh, hey, Lukey, the additional data came in, so I finished inputting it. What, already? You're quick. Yes, she is incredibly efficient at her work. She does more than she's asked to and rarely makes mistakes. With this level of work, she could easily get by at our head office, but her other problematic behaviors completely overshadow it. It's such a waste, and despite my numerous warnings, she only slightly improves and eventually reverts back to her old habits. She still calls me Luki. After two months of training her, I was reaching my breaking point. However, I resolved to do my best to make her a competent worker, and it was on that day. Heck, what should I do? Uh, Luki is troubled. While I was thinking in the break room, Anna suddenly popped up. It's been three months since we started working together. By now, she's capable enough to do her job alone. I mean, she still exhibits problematic behaviors, so I have to keep an eye on her. But it's break time, so I won't nag her. Oh, nothing. Just some personal stuff. But uh, even Luki has worries. What do you think I am? My mom's birthday is coming up. I'm not sure what to get her. Yes, my mom's birthday is just around the corner. But I'm out of ideas, and being single, I'm clueless about women's tastes. When I said that, Anna tilted her head and asked, Are you close to your mom? I guess so. She's always been the caring type. Um, how so? What do you mean? Well, even when she was incredibly busy, she always made sure to pack my lunch. My dad was away on business a lot, so my mom took care of everything at home. After I started living alone and learned how hard housework is, I realized how great my mother was. So, I'd like to celebrate her birthday somehow, but I'm having a hard time picking a present. Oh, I know. I should ask Anna. She seems to know more about women's preferences and current trends. Just as I was about to ask her, I fell silent. The usually overly cheerful Anna looked incredibly down. Anna, what's wrong? Huh? Oh, sorry, I don't have a mom. That's why I'm envious of your problem. Anna said that and forced a smile. But her fake smile quickly faded and she looked down, appearing dejected again. I was taken aback by the sight of Anna I'd never seen before. She looked so lonely. I couldn't leave her alone. You don't have to force yourself to smile. Yeah. Sometimes, Anna, you really force yourself to smile. It's okay to talk about your problems. After all, I'm, I'm your trainer. That's right. Anna hardly ever shares her concerns. Even with work, she doesn't voice her worries. I was worried that she might be overdoing it. As she widened her eyes in surprise, Anna said, you're the first person to say that to me, and began to tell me a story. It was a story about Anna's past. You know, my mom passed away in an accident when I was a little. After that, my dad just lost himself in his work, leaving me in the care of a maid. Anna shared her gaze drifting off into the distance. I was basically raised by the maid. I'm grateful to her, I really am. But then again, she was paid to take care of me, right? So, I can't help but wonder if there's really such a thing as unconditional love. Ha, huh? well, I guess it doesn't matter now that I'm all grown up. She said, laughing it off. 
Watching her, an idea began to form in my mind. Maybe Anna had grown up lacking affection. Her father, the CEO, understood that, which was why he couldn't bear to leave Anna alone and kept her in the company. Upon reaching that conclusion, her actions began to make more sense. Anna's problematic behavior is actually only to those close to her in the company. She often arrived late but would always be early when there was a business deal. She was quiet around people from other departments but often played around with me and those she was close to. I wondered, was this her way of interacting? Causing trouble to get her busy father's attention, could it be that she grew up without realizing it was wrong? That's why scolding her wouldn't fix her behavior. It wasn't that she didn't want to change, but rather, she might not know any other way to interact. Anna, I started, you're talented. It's about time you quit these problematic behaviors. Eh, ha ha, you're persistent, Luki. I've been a little better lately, haven't I? Don't evade the topic, keep this up, and someday you'll be abandoned. Abandoned, that's strange. No one's watching me, so there's nothing to abandon. Suddenly, Anna retorted with a serious look. With a dull voice, as if she had given up on something, I guess this was the real her. True self isn't noticed by anyone. She seems to believe that. I was a bit surprised by this unusual side of Anna, but I couldn't back down. She was wrong. I'll show you that you're wrong. Follow me. I declared, grabbing Anna's arm and leading her to a certain place. Anna, although surprised, obediently followed. This is the place I brought her to. The office floor we always worked on. Everyone was on break, chatting among themselves. I quietly opened the door just a little, showing Anna the scene inside. Well, did Anna make this document? She was so good that she could have made it at headquarters if she hadn't had those problems. I know, right? What a waste. There, everyone was praising Anna. And these were people Anna wasn't particularly close with. No way, why? Anna's eyes widened as she watched the scene unfold. That's how it goes, right? They are not the ones she's trying to get her attention from but they're watching her work. You understand, right? We're seeing you, so you don't need to stress about getting noticed anymore. There are people who notice you, Anna, without you having to try, and I'm one of them. I say this as I gently stroke the head of Anna, who quietly sheds tears. From that day forward, Anna's problematic behavior dramatically reduced. She's serious about her work now, and she's always on time. That's all well and good. Great changes indeed. But there's one slightly tricky part. Luke, today's the day. You're going to be my boyfriend. Somehow, I ended up in a wild situation where Anna confesses her love to me every single day. It seems after our talk, Anna came to trust me a lot and she started to consult me about various things. As a result, she became very attached to me and now she confesses her love to me every day. However, I had to turn her down. She's young, and there are plenty of great guys out there for her. But it seems she just can't give up. For the last two weeks, I've been on the receiving end of her constant advances. When faced with such intense appeals, my feelings to her was changing. Okay, let's go out. I think I've fallen for you, Anna. Today's the day I'll become your girlfriend, huh? That's what I said. It's okay. At, at what? Anna responds with a bright red face. It seems she wasn't expecting to get the okay. But next thing I knew, she was crying buckets and hugging me tight, saying I, I did it. I'll work hard. I'll become a woman worthy of you, Luke. Stay with me forever. Whoa, okay, okay. This is our workplace. And that's how we started dating. But there are many difficulties between us. There is some bad friction between Anna and her father, 
No, he's a father who thanks me for helping his daughter, so there must be some misunderstanding. First, I went to Anna's house with her to clear up this misunderstanding. Of course, the CEO gave me a very disapproving look. He entrusted me with his daughter, and here I was getting involved with her. The one most surprised by this reaction was Anna. She thought her father didn't care about her. And this is where the real trouble started. Her father showing concern for her was nice and all, but he was opposed to our marriage. They had a huge fight, but it seemed like it helped them vent their pent-up frustrations. You're always working and neglecting me. Don't act like a father now. I am your father. I've been worried about you. Well, it's too late to worry now, silly. They argued and argued, but finally had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. The CEO, I mean, my father-in-law, was confused about how to deal with his grown-up daughter, and in his fear of hurting her, he distanced himself from her. This only led to him losing his ability to communicate with her, and he had his own set of worries. Anna realized she was causing her father distress, and that she was loved. Finally, the two of them made peace. Of course, our marriage was approved, and next we went to greet my parents. Anna, who never had a mother, was very nervous, but my mom had already heard about the situation and said, I'm happy to become your mother. Anna was so moved by this that she started crying. On top of that, my mom treated us to dinner, which moved Anna so much that she said, I want to cook this too, and asked my mom to teach her how to cook. Now they're the best of friends. With both families' approval, we happily got married, and now we're a blessed family with three kids. My father-in-law is so smitten with his grandchild. His stern face that I've seen at work is nowhere to be found. Anna was surprised to see a side of my father-in-law that she had never seen before, but she said, it feels like we've finally become a family. I'm so happy. I guess that's a good thing. We couldn't have a wedding because of Anna's pregnancy, but I'd like to see her in a wedding dress someday. With those thoughts, we continue to live happily each day. How did you find today's story? By clicking the subscribe and like button, it will be an encouragement for my content creation. I look forward to hearing from all of you in the comments. See you in the next video. My name's Joe. This was after a casual drink with my colleagues at the end of the workday. I think it was a little past 8 o'clock at night. Just as I was about to enter the convenience store near my house, a young girl came out there. The smell of shampoo wafting from her hair was so incredibly strong that I half turned my head and followed her with my eyes. Sure enough, I knew her. She lived in the apartment building across from mine. Though we had never spoken, we would give each other a nod if we happened to see each other in front of our apartments. She had a short haircut with a little flip at the ends. I'm not great at understanding women's hairstyles, but it seemed to be called a mullet hair. I thought she was a college student, probably in her early 20s. She wasn't flashy, but had a kind of soft, approachable, and cute face. Usually, she was well-dressed, but that night, she was in a tracksuit unusually. She staggered down the street at night, weighed down by the plastic bags she carried in both hands. After I finished at the convenience store and entered the alleyway to my apartment, I saw her not far ahead, standing still with two plastic bags at her feet. One of the bags had ripped open under the weight of its contents. What's wrong? I asked. When I called out, she looked up at me with a pleading expression. It's just heavy. Following her words, I looked at the bags on the ground. Each bottle contained four to gallon of mineral water eight in total. I thought it was a rather hefty purchase and decided to lend a hand. I'll carry half of it. You live in that apartment building over there, right? Yes, but are you sure? I assured her it was no problem. 
although I was a bit bothered by the overpowering smell of her shampoo. As we walked along carrying the bags full of water bottles, I asked about the situation. About an hour ago, she had been using the shower at home. Just as she started washing her hair with shampoo, the hot water stopped. She had only planned on showering, so the bathtub was empty. She wiped off the shampoo suds with a bath towel as best she could, and then stepped out of the bathroom in her tracksuit. So she hadn't rinsed off the shampoo, that's why the smell was so intense. I nodded in understanding, feeling strangely satisfied with her explanation. Despite this, her story continued. Just as she stepped out of the bathroom, the doorbell rang. It was her neighbor, checking to see if her water was also out. It turned out the water was out in all the apartments, and everyone started making a fuss. Someone called the property management company who managed the building. When they came to check, it turned out to be a problem with the water tank. They called a professional to repair it, but it couldn't be fixed that night, and so, everyone had to spend a night without water. That's why she had gone to buy bottled water at the convenience store. I helped her carry the water bottles up to her room. She thanked me repeatedly, looking quite embarrassed. That's quite a disaster, must feel awful with your hair full of shampoo. At my words, she put her hand on her own head. Yes, so, after buying the water, I thought I'd boil some and wash it out. As she said this, something flashed in her mind, and her eyes lit up. Right, there's a spot on the street past the convenience store, isn't there? Maybe I'll go there. It's been a while since I last visited a spot. I wouldn't usually. I nodded, turned on my heel to leave, and then remembered something. Remembered, and turned back to her. That spot, it's closed on Tuesdays. Her hand, which was inserting the key into the lock, suddenly stopped. Then she looked at me with her mouth gaping. There weren't any other internet cafes or the like where she could use a shower in this neighborhood. If you'd like, you can use mine. It's old, but I keep it clean, so it's not dirty. She lived in what you might call a fancy designer condo. In contrast, I lived in a 40-year-old, two-story wooden apartment building. At best, it was of a retro design, but simply put, the decay was severe. It was a rickety old apartment. But I liked it. There wasn't any particular inconvenience, and the location was good. My room was on the second floor, and it got decent sunlight. And above all, the rent was by far the cheapest in this area. I even doubted whether it was a crime scene when I first moved in. The layout of the room was such that as soon as you entered the front door, the kitchen, about the size of a small dining room, was to the right and a bathroom unit was to the left, and there was just one larger room in the back. She was a little hesitant about my invitation, but losing to the unpleasant feeling of her hair, she eventually came to borrow the shower. She came to my room with a fearful look on her face, looked around with a curious look on her face, and then entered the bathroom. Immediately, I heard the sound of hot water running and pitter-pattering from the shower. I felt as though I was listening to a sound I shouldn't be hearing. So, I turned on the TV in a hurry. Thanks to you, I feel refreshed. I'm glad I could be of help. Exchanging these words, I saw her off from the doorway. A few days later, in the area where my apartment is located, there was a prior notice that due to power supply demand tightness, a planned power outage would be implemented for about two hours from around 7 p.m. It may be inappropriate for me to say this, but I was looking forward to a little taste of what a power outage would be like, if only for a couple of hours. And at exactly 7 p.m., it became pitch dark outside the window. The lights in my room remained on. Wondering what was going on, I went outside of the apartment. It turned out that even though this whole area was said to be affected, my apartment was excluded, 
and the power outage had occurred up to the other side of the narrow lane. I was left a bit surprised, not knowing whether to be happy or disappointed. Then, she came out of the condo across the street, which was affected by the power outage. When I greeted her, she also bowed her head saying, thank you for the other day. And then she sighed and said, it's a power outage this time, it's so annoying, and I have an exam tomorrow. She had heard the notice about the planned power outage, but it seemed like she was sure it would be canceled. But still, taking the previous water outage as a lesson, she had stored some water. In cases where water tanks are used in condos, water is sent to each room using electricity, so if there is a power outage, water will also stop. And when the power really went out and the lights turned off, she thought she would try to imagine the exam questions in the dark, almost like a meditation. She was thinking about making some tea to calm down. But my place is fully electric, so not only do the lights not turn on, but I also can't get water or heat water. And so, far from calming down, she became frustrated and decided to go to a fast food restaurant near the station to study. I was about to tell her that in my room, the lights are on and I can heat water, but I decided not to. Instead, I said, well then, good luck, take care, and saw her off. Then, the next evening, when I was returning from work and about to leave the station, I saw her arguing with the station staff inside the ticket gate. Good evening. Is something wrong? Oh, Joe. I didn't remember introducing myself to her, but maybe she had seen my nameplate when she came to borrow my shower. I don't have enough money for the train fare. Train fare? How much? She answered with a face that looked like the world was ending. 80 cents. 80 cents. Nowadays, 80 cents. I couldn't help but laugh out loud. But anyways, I lent her the money anyway. She successfully exited the train station and headed home with me. I think I dropped my phone in the train, she said. She's always been one to go cashless, paying with her phone wherever she went. Of course, she carried a bit of cash too. But that day, she had just finished her college exams and had an early dinner with her friends to celebrate. The restaurant they entered only took cash, and she used up most of the cash she had. Then she took the train, but she used her phone as her train pass as well. She was able to go through the ticket gate when she boarded the train with her phone, but after she got off, she lost her phone and couldn't get out of the station. When she explained the situation to the station staff, they checked for lost items, but told her, we have no matching reports yet. You can either wait a little longer or hope that the train crew finds it when the train she was on goes back to the garage. Regardless, she had to pay the train fare. It was okay to self-report the station she got on at. She should have just said she boarded from the next station, but she honestly answered. As a result, the fare from that station was 80 cents more than what she had left in her wallet. If she had a debit card, she could have withdrawn cash from the ADM on campus, but she always left her debit card at home and rallied on her phone. The next morning, she came to visit me out of breath as I was leaving for work. She had withdrawn cash from the ADM at a convenience store last night. Since she didn't have a landline at home, she searched for a public phone in the neighborhood and just contacted the railway company. Then she found out that her phone was stored as a lost item. So I'm going to go pick it up now. Saying that, she ran off, then came back to me as if she remembered something, and paid me back the 80 cents I lent her yesterday. Watching her leave, I couldn't help but laugh. I felt like I had become her uncle or something. Then, next weekend, while I was shopping at a nearby supermarket and checking out, I spotted her at the next register. She was, unlearned, paying with her phone again. After checking out, I approached her at the batting station and spoke to her. Hello, are you shopping? 
She looked surprised for a moment, but as soon as she recognized me, she smiled and said, We've been running into each other a lot lately, haven't we? Maybe we just didn't notice each other before. We might have been passing by each other all the time. We left the supermarket and walked home together. Lately, I've been really unlucky. Remember the water cut off and the scheduled power outage the other day and dropping my phone in the train fare. She looked up in the sky and shook her shoulders back and forth in a bored manner. I'm really fed up. I failed my college exam and I made a mistake at my part-time job and got scolded. And the other day when I was walking on the street, I even got pooped on by a crow. I chuckled through my nose. Hey, we all have times like that. Suddenly, she got an idea and said, Hey, Joe, can I use your kitchen today? I said, okay, but asked why, and she answered. The reason she hasn't been lucky lately is because of the apartment she's living in. Since she moved there, she feels like her luck has turned bad. I'm not good at cooking, but I'm good at making omelets but the apartment I'm living in is all electric with an induction heater. She said that with an induction heater, she couldn't make an omelet the way she wanted. I thought blaming it on the tools was a bit much. Maybe it's a kind of exorcism. If I can make a good omelet with gas, maybe I'll move to a place that's not all electric. I didn't expect the word exorcism to come out of her mouth. Sure, why not? Give it a try. I'll taste it for you. The omelette she made turned out overcooked and hard, far from delicious. Several more days passed. A major hurricane was approaching, and the company ordered us to finish work early. Just after 4 p.m., I left the office and got on the train for home. As predicted, the weather was threatening, with strong winds blowing and ominous, thick rain clouds hanging in the sky. I did some shopping at the usual supermarket on the way home and hurried back to my apartment. When I got there, she was sitting alone in a squatting position in front of my door. What are you doing? Is something wrong? I asked. She looked up with a sad face and told me that a group of friends from her college club, who she was very close with, had organized a mixer a few days ago. She found out today that she was the only one not invited. She said she felt left out. What a foolish thing to worry about. Well, that's youth for you. I said, laughing off the situation. Anyway, the wind is getting stronger and it's starting to rain. The storm is coming. You should go home. Or would you like to come in? To my surprise, she said she would like to come into my apartment. The storm was getting closer and the wind and rain were intensifying. My 40-year-old poorly constructed apartment was making all sorts of creaking and groaning noises. She looked anxious the whole time. She probably has never heard such noises in her fancy apartment. Are you going to eat with me? I'm making fried rice for dinner. I called out from the kitchen. She happily accepted the offer and came to the kitchen. I placed the frying pan on the gas stove, added some oil, and started tossing in the ingredients one by one. With a swift backward pull, I tossed the fried rice in the air with the pan. Wow, you are good. Can I try? She asked. I handed over the pan to her, who was very motivated. She shut the pan once. The fried rice in the pan didn't budge. With a serious look on her face, she tried again, putting more strength into it. The fried rice leaped out of the pan, scattering around. Oh no, it spilled out, she said. Let me do this, I offered. I gently pushed her to the back of the room and resumed cooking. Then, we sat across from each other at a small table and ate the fried rice. Thanks to the storm, the room was noisy with all the creaking and groaning. Have you lived here for a long time? She asked. Well, I'm about to renew my lease for the third time, so about six years, almost seven, actually. Why do you ask? I responded, looking up at her. She seemed lost in thought. Then, she pulled out her phone and showed me the screen. 
It was a horoscope ad. It says, a time of many troubles. Reconsidering your current environment might be beneficial. Do you believe this kind of stuff? I asked. Well, not necessarily, but it's kind of on my mind. Some things do come true, she replied. Now, I understood what she was trying to say. She had previously mentioned that her recent streak of bad luck might be due to her current apartment. And now, this horoscope suggests she should reconsider her environment. The first thing that came to her mind when she thought about changing her environment was her apartment. She may be wondering if she should move or not. And so, out of curiosity, she asked me how long I've been living here. The other day, it was an exorcism, now a horoscope. I realized she was surprisingly superstitious. So, are you thinking of moving? I asked. How did you know? Are you a clairvoyant? She responded. What a clairvoyance. So she's not only superstitious. Well, why not? A fresh start can be a good thing. Maybe you should consider moving, I suggested. I guess so. Maybe I really should move after all. She seemed to be still struggling. But I thought, if she decided to move and disappeared from the apartment across the street, I would feel lonely in a different way. She said she was about to go home, so she was putting on her shoes in the entryway. The peak of the hurricane seemed to have passed, but even so, it was still pouring rain outside. Thanks for the fried rice. Hold on, I'll walk you home. With that, I grabbed my coat and quickly put on my shoes. Even though I said I'd walk her home, her apartment was right across the street. The width of the street is only about 13 feet. It only takes a few steps to get to the other side. But I wanted to walk her home. We descended to the first floor of the apartment. I opened the coat I was carrying, and we both held it above our heads like a makeshift umbrella. Let's go. Then, one step, two steps. The rainwater pooled on the road splashed up. Three more steps and we could cross the road. I shouted, holding her shoulder. All right, let's go for it. Yes, on your marks, get set, go. Hop, step, jump. We landed in front of her apartment. Then, she pulled my hand and dragged me into the entrance. I've decided, I'm going to move. Ah, so you've decided. I regretted a bit for telling her to move unnecessarily. Can I have your contact? When she asked, I gave her my cell phone number. She saved that into her smartphone. I'll send you an email later. I silently nodded and said goodbye to her. A month later, she left the apartment across the street. I thought I would feel lonely not seeing her face anymore, but that was not the case. Instead, I became busier. Because I'm exchanging emails with her many times a day. How did you like today's story? Your channel subscription and likes give me the motivation to keep creating. I'm also looking forward to reading your comments. See you in the next video. In April, it seems people have the itch to try something new. Just like every year, as the end of April approaches, there's been an increase in climbers with brand new gear. At the lodge, while serving meals, I'm constantly on the lookout for anyone who might be overconfident in their shiny new equipment. Preventing accidents before they happen is also part of the job for those of us making a living off the mountain. My name's Jake Sullivan. I just turned 29 this year. If you ask me about my profession, I'd stumble a bit on the answer. Currently, I'm working as a mountain guide and part-time at the lodge. I stay in the U.S. working these part-time jobs, and once I've saved up enough, I set out to conquer mountains overseas. Mountaineering is expensive, and things like permits can be a hassle, so I can't always jump right into it. It's especially tough for a broke climber like me. 
but a job with a goal in mind doesn't feel like a burden. This season, being able to live and entrust myself to the wilderness is my ideal environment. Today is the last Saturday of April, and many people are heading into a long weekend. The lodge is bustling. There are plenty of regulars. But there was one woman who clearly stood out. She seemed to have depleted quite a bit of energy to get here. Her pale complexion didn't strike me as that of a frequent mountain goer. She was panting and carefully settled herself down at a corner in front of the lodge so as not to get in the way of others. She was constantly checking the heel of her left foot. She probably has a blister from her new hiking boots. I went inside the lodge for a moment, picked up a band-aid specially designed for blisters, and approached the woman. The sun hid behind my back, casting a shadow around her as she sat down. Huh. When I saw her lift her head in surprise, I was momentarily captivated. I mean, she was more beautiful than any other woman I had ever met. I'm not sure how to explain it, but she had a sort of translucent, fragile beauty. Her long jet black hair was tied up with a hair tie, but it shone brilliantly. Excuse me, aren't you getting a blister? Here, take this. As I offered her a plaster, she looked at me suspiciously. She seemed to be on guard, being approached by a big guy on top of a mountain. I explained that I was a mountain guide and also worked part-time at a mountain hut. With this, her tension eased a bit. Thank you. In a small voice, she accepted the plaster. All the while, I couldn't help but look at her gear. It all seemed brand new, like this was her first time hiking. How far are you planning to go? I casually asked her as she took off her hiking boots and lowered her socks to check her heel. It was already past noon. If she aimed for the summit from here, she would end up walking back in the dark, which could be dangerous. Ideally, I wanted her to turn back here or aim for the summit tomorrow morning. Despite my hopes, she told me that she intended to reach the summit. Fog was starting to hang around the summit. Mountain weather can change quickly. Even if you aim for the summit now, it will be dark by the time you descend. There's fog coming in as well. Wouldn't it be better to give up for today and aim for the summit tomorrow morning after spending the night at the hut? On hearing my words, she frowned in discomfort. She seemed to dislike being instructed by others. But this was a matter of life, and I wasn't ready to back down just yet. If she got lost and the colleagues who went to rescue her got into trouble, I couldn't bear the thought. I appreciate your concern, but I have my own plans. I find it uncomfortable to be directed by a stranger like you. Contrary to her delicate and seemingly quiet appearance, she clearly voiced her opinion. I was a little surprised by this unexpected gap. Casting a glance at me, she quickly started to pack her things. She seemed to want to leave here as soon as possible. Hold on a minute, are you really going? She ignored my hurried words. It looked like it was going to be difficult to stop her. I quickly called out to the boss of the mountain hut, explaining that a potentially dangerous guest was going up and I was going to accompany her. He quickly gave the go-ahead, so I grabbed my always ready backpack and followed her. Soon, I could see her brand new backpack. Thinking she might dislike it if I got too close, I kept my distance while watching her clumsy hike. Just as I expected, her pace was slow. All the other hikers we passed were hurrying down the mountain. The fog near the peak thickened and the scent of rain grew stronger. Unaware of the changing weather, she was persistently moving her feet. Even a dull guy like me could tell that she had some reason for climbing this mountain. I wish I could grant her desire. But this weather isn't good. I caught up with her at a run and called out. We'll have rain soon. Let's turn back. Caught on the shoulder by me, she turns back in surprise. 
Her face had turned completely pale. She must have been pushing herself too hard to get this far. It might even be difficult to turn back all at once from here. You're persistent. Leave me alone. She tried to shake off my hand on her shoulder, but it seems like she didn't have the strength left for even that. The next moment, a streak of lightning flashes, followed by a thunderclap. Big droplets of rain started to fall immediately. Do you have a raincoat? She shakes her head in response to my question. I was a little annoyed at whatever sports store she had gotten her gear from. Not at her. I was annoyed at the salesperson who hadn't given her any rain gear. But this was no time to be annoyed. The rain was getting worse by the second. I hurriedly set up a small tent in a place off the path that looked safe. For now, get in. Just after I forced the somewhat resistant her into the tent, the rain turned into a downpour. I'm glad we made it in just in time. I was deeply relieved that we got in before we were soaked to the bone. The small tent was barely enough for two people. To prevent it from being blown away, I'd go outside once and secure it properly. When I come back into the tent, she silently offers me a towel. Thanks. I gratefully wipe my wet body with the towel. It smelled faintly of fabric softener. It was pouring. The raindrops seemed like they might pierce through the tent. I used a solid fuel to boil water and made cocoa. It was a storm outside, but the sweet aroma of the cocoa made me forget about it. The inside of the small tent felt like a different world. Here you go. As I offered her the prepared cocoa, she slightly nodded and accepted it. The cocoa warmed her from inside. Perhaps it was just my imagination, but her complexion seemed a bit better. Tomorrow morning, let's aim for the summit. There was no response from her to my words. The next morning, the rain ceased as if it had never been. We decided to head for the summit at dawn with the sunrise. She insisted that she could go alone, but I persuaded her and watched from a close but not too close distance. Maybe she was getting used to the mountain a bit. Her footsteps seemed lighter than yesterday. As her determination to reach the summit is such high, she'll surely smile once she reaches the top. I followed her, thinking such thoughts. Now here comes the unbelievable part. When we finally reached the summit, there was no smile on her face. She was just staring intently at the other mountains visible from the peak. I couldn't possibly think she had come mountain climbing because she liked mountains. She didn't even take pictures or express joy. She left the summit within less than five minutes. And just like that, she started descending as if fleeing. She didn't look back at me and of course, didn't utter a single word of gratitude. I didn't help her because I wanted gratitude, but it still saddened me. In the end, I never even got to know her name. I've met an unbelievably rude woman. As soon as I got back to the cabin, I told my part-time colleagues about last night. I rarely get angry, but my colleagues found it funny and laughed at me holding their stomachs. I truly thought she was a rude woman. That was my first encounter with her. Mountains are inherently dangerous, and even the skilled people can abruptly lose their lives. A senior who guides mountain climbing with me, called Bob, once lost a climbing partner on a mountain abroad. Both of them had a long history of climbing and were skilled. It's sudden, Bob chuckled bitterly. Today was the third anniversary of his climbing partner's death. He asked me to accompany him to pay respects, so I went with him to buy incense and flowers for the deceased's grave. The destination was a well-kept cemetery. In one corner of the cemetery, I saw a figure praying ardently in front of the tombstone. As we approached, the figure quickly stood up. What? It's the rude woman I met on the mountain the other day. In my astonishment, 
The truth slipped out of my mouth. Suddenly, Bob reached out and covered my mouth. Bob, you remembered my husband's third year anniversary, didn't you? She quietly said. I could feel a tense energy radiating from Bob, who stood next to me. Bob is usually a bright individual and always positive. He never feels out of place and is kind to everyone. Seeing such a person so tensed up, I was taken aback. There's no way I could forget, Laura. Bob managed to squeeze out. It seems like she is Laura, the wife of his late climbing partner, that he would address her by her first name. They must have been close in the past. But now, there's a cold wind blowing between the two. Laura stared at Bob with icy eyes. Did you climb the mountain? Did you get to like it a bit? Bob asked after a moment of silence. Probably he couldn't withstand Laura's cold gaze and silence any longer. No, not at all. I despise it even more. I just can't understand people who climb mountains. Laura said, her lips twisted in disdain. It seemed as if she was choosing her words to hurt Bob. Laura, do you hate me? What, you're asking the obvious? Of course, I hate both the mountain and you. Leaving these harsh words behind, Laura walked away. After she left, Bob just crumbled and sat down on the spot. That night, I went out for drinks with Bob. I was worried about letting him go home alone. He rarely got drunk, but that night, he was terribly inebriated. Again and again, he mumbled words of apology to Laura in a groaning voice. I have never seen Bob like this before. It almost made me hate Laura, who was pushing him to this point. By the time I managed to get him into his apartment, the sky was already beginning to lighten. The next day, Bob was back to his usual self. Looking a little shy, he apologized for his behavior the night before, saying, sorry about that. All I could muster was, it's okay. Once I returned to the mountains, I diligently continued my work. By the time the tourist season was ending, I could see the prospects of securing funds for my next climbing expedition. I was considering trying to climb Denali in Alaska. That's what I had been thinking about all this time. Of course, I didn't have such a conceited idea that I could conquer it in one go. I am merely a challenger. I intend to challenge it as many times as it takes. Upon hearing this, my longtime friend, Steve, offered to support me. He is looking for companies that could provide financial support. The reason I had come down from the mountains to return to the city after such a long time was because I received a message from him saying that he had found a company likely to provide funding. It happened to be a time when preparations that couldn't be done in the mountains, like gathering equipment and submitting applications, had been piling up. I borrowed a suit, something I was not accustomed to wearing, from Steve and got myself reasonably dressed. I told him that I should be fine in my usual outfit, but Steve told me, it's a big corporation. The place he took me to was the headquarters of a large company that even I, being disconnected from the world, knew about. The massive building was overwhelming. From the entrance, you could see business people in suits going in and out, looking very busy. I couldn't believe that Steve had managed to rope in such a big company. I followed him into the building's entrance. The lobby at the end of the bright, open atrium seemed to reflect a positive and open corporate culture. While Steve was confirming our appointment at the reception counter, I absentmindedly stared into the lobby. Right in the center of the lobby, they were in the process of refreshing the flowers in a large vase. Huh, is that? There she was Laura. She was arranging flowers in front of the large vase with certainty. Her profile looked very serious. I looked around to see if there was any other staff, but there was no one. Noticing my gaze, Laura stopped arranging the flowers and looked over. 
I involuntarily shuddered. Narrowing her eyes slightly, she confirmed it was me, and without hesitation, started walking towards me. I panicked at her approach. I thought she might throw harsh words at me again. I had an important presentation coming up. It would be disastrous if my spirit broke at a time like this. But there was nowhere for me to escape. I closed my eyes tightly and repeated a soothing mantra. I even prayed that she had mistaken me for someone else. I, I didn't get your name before. I have something I need to apologize to you for. I opened my eyes wide in response to her unexpected words. There in front of me was the face of the woman I'd been smitten with that day. When we met on the mountain, I think her makeup had all but melted away due to sweat, leaving her almost barefaced. Today, Laura had her makeup neatly done and seemed like a professional woman. What, uh, what do you mean? Suddenly, I was thrown into confusion by her change in attitude. In my dream, I was scolded by him. Her late husband appeared in her dream, apparently scolding her for her disrespectful behavior towards me. It seemed she was repeatedly urged to forgive my mentor, Bob. I thought about it when I woke up. I was immature. I sort of ran away without even thanking you for saving my life. Thank you for that time. She said a bit bashfully and deeply bowed to me. I somehow felt embarrassed and acted awkwardly. If you have time, I would like to treat you to lunch. I owe you an apology for many things. As I nervously responded, Laura proposed this. Of course, I readily agreed. Laura smiled happily and said, I'm glad upon hearing my response. She went back to her work after we decided to meet up at the entrance. Steve, watching me entranced by her, rolled his eyes. The presentation to the company was a great success, and it was decided we would receive financial support. It seems they'll also provide us with gear. It's truly a blessing. I deeply appreciated Steve's effort. Laura arrived a bit late to the entrance where we decided to meet. I'm sorry, I was tied up with some work stuff. I was again taken aback as she runs up, panting. I guess she's just my type. I've never felt like this in my life before. The place Laura had reserved was a restaurant serving Nepalese cuisine. It seems it was her late husband's favorite restaurant. The dal soup with spices, herbs, and beans was also my favorite, so I was genuinely happy that she chose this restaurant. He used to bring me here a lot. He said he would eat this in Nepal as well. He used all kinds of ways to try to take me to the mountains. She smiled a little sadly as she remembers her late husband. Thinking about Laura's feelings makes my heart take a little. Did you have some business with that company after coming down from the mountain? When asked by Laura, I told her that they've become our corporate sponsor. I informed Laura that I would be challenging Denali next. She frowned a little at that. Denali, uh, it's been a while since I've heard that. It's a mountain that every climber longs for. She must have heard it numerous times from her husband. Perhaps even Laura's husband had expressed his desire to challenge Denali. Um, I, um, I'm sorry. Without thinking, the words of apology slipped out. At my words, Laura's eyes widened in surprise. And then, in the next moment, her eyes narrowed in a smile. Don't be silly. There's nothing to apologize for. With a tone like she was talking to a child, I found myself feeling somewhat diminished. I'm not a child who can't understand what he said in his dreams, but hatred and forgiveness are complicated things. Laura said that she understood this in her head. No one was at fault. But she can't stop the feelings of hatred. Forgiving is even more difficult. Living is quite a tough task. Laura sighed softly. For the first time, I felt like I touched the folds of a human heart. 
It was delicate, complex, and sometimes troublesome, but it felt like evidence of being human. Perhaps you don't have to forgive. That's the general public's opinion, not necessarily how you feel, right? I wasn't sure if I should say such a thing. But I couldn't not say it. There is no need to conform to a certain mold. You can hate when you feel hatred. Forgive when the time comes to forgive. I think that kind of freedom should be allowed. A distressed image of my senior, Bob, crossed my mind, but these words were my true feelings. It's just absurd to suppress feelings in order to fit in the stereotype. Yes, thank you, I feel a lot better. As she said that, Laura's face seemed to lighten, like a weight had been lifted off her. As we said goodbye, Laura reached out her hand for a handshake. I firmly gripped her slender hand in return. She didn't say a word, but I felt like her hand was saying, come back alive. I met Laura again a year and a half after that day. My attempt at Denali had ended in failure. Bad weather played a part, but the mistake was mine. It would be fair to say that it was a desperate retreat. In the continuing bad weather, I dug a snow cave and endured. If rescue had come even a day later, I don't think I would have survived. When I woke up in the hospital, flown in by helicopter, all medical procedures had been completed. I had two toes and my right little and ring fingers amputated due to frostbite. When I heard about the procedure, I didn't feel despair. I just thought that I could still climb. It might sound stupid, but that's really what I thought. The first thing I did today, after finishing my treatment and finally returning to the States, was to look for a hamburger shop. I just wanted to have American food, and I couldn't help it. I ordered cheeseburger at an old, traditional restaurant. After one bite, I felt like crying. I felt like I had finally come home. Next, I went to see Laura. I knew where her flower shop was before leaving the States. Not wanting to disturb her work, I waited at a nearby cafe until her shop closed. I could see Laura working. I think spending my afternoon absent-mindedly watching Laura going about her daily routine, a life I knew nothing about, was a luxury. In line with the closing time of the flower shop, I left the cafe. And then, I eagerly waited outside the flower shop for Laura to come out. Laura. After making sure she had pulled down the shutter and locked it, I called out to her quietly. Sitting on the guardrail on the sidewalk, I waved to her. Laura was genuinely surprised. What, Jake, really? She put her bag down in front of the shutter and ran over to me. I jumped off the guardrail and extended my right hand to her. The right hand she had extended to me when we said goodbye. I thought it was my turn to offer it this time. When Laura ran over to me, she took a sharp breath as she looked at my face. The signs of severe frostbite were still very visible on my face. It was in a pretty bad shape. Even a part of the top of my ear was missing. On top of that, my right hand was still wrapped in bandages. It was obvious something had happened. I'm back, Laura. Seeing my outstretched right hand, Laura seemed to understand everything. Her face crumpled and she looked down. She probably remembered her late husband. I'm back. I say it one more time, looking into her face and smiling. There's no reason for you to say I'm back to me. Laura says that, batting away my right hand. Her voice trembles slightly. I know it's selfish, but I think the reason I survived and came back was because I felt like I had to say I'm home to you. Inside the snow cave, each time I felt like I was losing consciousness, I remembered Laura's face as she arranged flowers with such concentration. Even about the first time we met on the mountain. Again and again, I kept remembering Laura. And I thought, I want her to smile. Her sad face, her angry face, her troubled face, they are all lovely. 
but I want to see Laura's smiling face. When I say I'm home, I want her to say welcome back as if it's the most natural thing in the world. You say the same thing. He used to say the same thing. As Laura let out a small sigh along with her words, she slowly lifted her face to look at me. She looked at me as if she was searching for something. She probably wanted to know my true feelings. I think the one who taught me about being human was you when all I thought about was the mountain in the past. The only one who can fill the void in me as a human is you, probably. I was a bit embarrassed and my voice trailed off towards the end, but that's how I really feel. Will you fill the void in my heart? At Laura's words, I nodded enthusiastically and picked her up like a child. I'm home, Laura. When I put my forehead to hers and said that, Laura chuckled. Welcome back, I'm glad you're safe. Laura's smile was clear like glass, and it was the kind of smile that made me feel like I had to protect her forever. A few years later, I challenged Denali once again and succeeded. From the summit, I made a call via satellite phone to report my successful climb. The one receiving that call was Laura, waiting for me at the base camp, remembering her smile as she enthusiastically said she'd be the first one to say welcome back. I'll be back soon. I said that at the end of the call. On the other side of the phone, Laura answered with a year. Yeah. I gripped it firmly in my hand. I was torn whether I should really go ahead with it. My eyes turned to the woman in front of me. Her cheeks were blushing and her eyes glistened as she looked at me. Seeing her up close was breathtaking. She was so beautiful. I'm sure she must have steeled herself to be here. If that's the case, I'd like to respond to her wishes, too. Because I felt the same way as she did. So, I pushed it in, all the way. I'll never forget her joy in that moment, for as long as I live. What I'm about to tell you is about a fateful reunion with a woman who used to hate me. I'm James Peterson, a 32-year-old gynecologist working at a hospital. Although I am now steadily gaining experience as a doctor and working well, I actually went a long way to become a doctor. I had two failed attempts before I got into med school. Or rather, I didn't take the exam for two years. I was in a top performing class in high school and within the range of getting into a medical school. But on the day of the preliminary exam, my chronically ill mother collapsed. The exam became the least of my concerns, and I didn't go to the exam center. I spent two years supporting my mother, who was on the brink of life and death. It might have been a detour, but there's nothing more important than life, so I have no regrets. Sadly, my mother passed away, but I am glad that I could be there for her. I always dreamt of becoming a doctor, and through my mother's battle with illness, my desire became even stronger. So, two years later than my peers, I entered medical school. Now, working as a doctor, a woman transferred to my hospital. The beautiful classmate from high school who used to hate me, Amanda, became my patient. Well, it would be more accurate to say that she was always competing with me, rather than hating me. Amanda and I went to the same preparatory school. We were always competing for top grades, and she treated me as a rival on her own accord. I didn't particularly feel that she was a rival, but it is true that competing with her motivated me to study harder. Maybe because she saw me as a rival, she was always tough on me. She often told me, I will not lose to you, but I admired her competitiveness, which was a stark contrast to my laid-back personality, and I thought it was cool. In high school, I hadn't told anyone except my homeroom teacher why I gave up on the exam. Of course, I didn't tell a man either. I couldn't take the exam because my mother was critically ill. It was serious, and I was scared. 
I was afraid to say it out loud. I didn't want to say my mother was in critical condition. If I said it, the scene of my mother collapsing in front of me would come to my mind. I couldn't bear the sympathetic looks from everyone. But Amanda, not knowing the reason, seemed to think that I had run away before the exam. You didn't have the confidence, and you ran away. Not even going to the exam site, you're such a coward. She insulted me like that and wouldn't talk to me from then on. She got accepted into a prestigious university. It was the university she had always claimed she would get into since our freshman year of high school. She was honest with her feelings and straightforward. She was hard on herself and others, but she never shied away from making the effort that matched. To me, she seemed dazzling. Who would have thought that Amanda would become my patient? I wonder how she will react. The reunion was a mix of happiness and a bit of fear. I met Amanda when I was shopping at a convenience store before work. She didn't know I was her attending doctor yet, because I hadn't greeted her as such. Also, maybe because I was in my casual clothes, she glared at me the moment she saw me and slightly laughed. You're a high school grad and sick. Such a loser in life, huh? It seems that because of my cancellation of the high school exam, I was a loser in her eyes. Um, I'm your doctor. What? What are you talking about? I showed her my name tag, which stated my title as a doctor, to the bewildered her. She was staring at it in a daze. After revealing at the store that I was her doctor, Amanda left the place without saying a word. I went to her room to greet her later, but... She didn't say anything, perhaps she was still angry. She had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer at another hospital and was transferred to my hospital for surgery. The hospital where I work has a good reputation for gynecology and attracts patients from other hospitals for surgery. After examining her condition at this hospital, it seems likely that one of her ovaries will need to be removed. The extent of the progression and the treatment plan after the surgery would be determined. But then, Amanda started saying something completely unexpected. I'm not going to have surgery. Excuse me, what did you say? Listen carefully, you dummy. I said I'm not having surgery. If you got it, just leave me alone. I explained the importance of the surgery, but she wouldn't listen. I wondered if she didn't like me. So I had other doctors and nurses talk to her about the surgery, but no matter who talked to her, Amanda refused the surgery, and she wouldn't give any reasons. I wanted to respect the patient's wishes, but I wanted her to make a choice that values her life. More than anything, I was concerned that she won't give me a reason. One day, as I was troubled with how to deal with Amanda, I passed by her room and heard arguing voices from inside. So it's going to be an ovarian removal, huh? We have to call off the engagement. I saw for the first time someone who had come to visit Amanda. He was raising his voice, sounding irritated, at the patient. One of my ovaries will still be left. There won't be any problem. You don't know that for sure. What about the chance of getting pregnant? It's going to be lower than normal, right? Can you even have children? If you taunt, there's no point in us getting married. Please, don't say things like that. I'm not going to have the surgery. If I don't, both of my ovaries will remain. Ha! Huh? A derisive laugh from the man echoed through the hospital room. So, there won't be a complete cure for the cancer, right? And my wife will be a cancer patient in the first place. That's out of the question. There is only one thing I want from my wife, to bear children that will carry on my superior genes. I heard ovarian cancer can be hereditary. It would be a disaster if our child inherits it. The sound of Amanda's sobbing could be heard. If you are worried, let's get tested to see if it could be passed on. Just the fact that you have cancer is a huge turnoff. Don't drag me into your illness. You can handle it alone. Damn. I thought I had found a woman with both brains and beauty. You're just defective. 
I couldn't tolerate a man who didn't even know what the disease was and assumed it was inherited on his own. In the part where he scorned her as defective, what matters now shouldn't be whether his genes survive to the next generation. Isn't her life the most important thing? Even if she wanted children, it is women who bear children. Women risk their lives to give birth. I just couldn't accept that a man who disrespects women was ignoring her like this. Don't you love me anymore? Please, don't abandon me. In high school, she was dazzling as she worked towards her goals. I admired her. I was angry at the fact that she was crying and hanging on to such a scumbag. Unable to stand it any longer, I entered the hospital room. Nice to meet you, I'm Dr. Peterson, her primary physician. My sudden entrance seemed to surprise them. I could hear you all the way from outside. You're not family, are you? If you're not, you should leave. My sharp words clearly irritated the man. It's quite disrespectful of you. I've taken time out of my schedule for this woman. Even more reason for you to leave. Her valuable time is being wasted talking to you. If you're not idle, you should be on your way. Tisk. The man clicked his tongue, shooting Amanda a glare. Is it okay if I leave? If I leave, it's really over between us, okay? His tone seemed to contain a mocking laugh as if he was making a fool out of Amanda. Watching her cling and cry, he seemed to find amusement. Um, I, Amanda, her eyes moist, alternated her gaze between the man and me. The usually strong-willed Amanda was nowhere to be seen. That frustrated me. Do you need to cling to this kind of man? The Amanda Lino wasn't someone who compromised on herself. I heard you studied a lot and got a job at a good company. You worked just as hard in college, didn't you? You're an amazing person. Marriage is supposed to be a lifelong decision, right? You don't deserve someone who neglects your life and talks about your genes and defects. The man shouted things like you, and you're mocking me, as he listened to my words. Amanda was quietly watching me. And suitable, perhaps. Her words sounded younger than Amanda I knew. At this moment, Amanda seemed like a lost child. Maybe she was doubting her path due to the harsh words from the guy. Yeah, he's unsuitable. There should be someone else who will appreciate and cherish a hard worker like you. So don't lower yourself to the level of a scumbag like him. Upon hearing my words, Amanda closed her eyes and took a deep breath. When she opened them again, there were no signs of tears. Cries now regained their shine as she stared down at the man. We're done. Leave now. Uh, you sure you want to talk to me like that? I might forgive you if you apologize now. The man's earlier bravado was gone, and it was obvious that he was bluffing. He'd initiated the cruel conversation, but now he was unsettled by her desire to break up. I've had enough. We're finished. I'm glad I found out how small-minded you are before our marriage. What was I thinking? How did I not notice until now? I can't stand people who look down on the sick or who see women as mere tools for childbirth. I'm baffled as to what I ever saw in you. Leave right now. The man was speechless, having been chastised by the woman he once looked down upon. I opened the door to the hospital room gesturing outward with my hand. Then, with a smile, I said, please never come back. The man looked frustrated and fled back. With just the two of us in the hospital room, I asked for her permission and took a seat by the bed. Sorry for eavesdropping and barging in, but that guy, he's an absolute jerk. I couldn't stand it. Eavesdropping isn't a good hobby, but I'll forgive you. He used to have his gentle moments, but he showed his true colors when I fell ill. Yet, I was already in love with him, shamefully clinging to him. I wonder if my illness weakened me. Did you refuse surgery for his sake? She nodded slightly. It seemed she thought that if she didn't have her ovaries removed, he would stay by her side. 
but doing so wouldn't cure her illness. Maybe her mental was also weakened by the illness to the point where she didn't understand that. She laughed self-deprecatingly. Oh, you've seen an embarrassing side of me. I feel completely exposed. She seemed a bit embarrassed. But it might not be fair that she was the only one whose secret was known. I've also hidden something. Can I share it with you? I felt the need to reveal why I didn't take the college entrance exams. I told her about how my mother fell ill, how critical her condition was, and that I had to postpone my exams for two years to take care of her. Once I finished, she hit me gently with her pillow. Why didn't you tell me that? At such a tough time, I accused you of running away, didn't I? That's awful. I didn't want to worry you, so I couldn't say it. I thought getting pity would be painful, too. Saying this, she hit me again with her pillow. It didn't hurt at all, but each hit made a comical sound. Why should I be considerate of you? My rival, why won't worry about you? I told you to keep up with me, didn't I? I'll go to college first and work hard so you can't catch up, but I still want you to chase me. At her typical words, I couldn't help but laugh. So, she wouldn't pity me, huh? It seems that I had misunderstood her. From there, we were engrossed in stories from our student days. She, who had been crying in front of her boyfriend until just now, was regaining her energy, occasionally showing anger or laughter. This is the way she should be. Her clinging to such a terrible guy is just not like her. So, what will you do about the surgery? She looked at me blankly before laughing defiantly. Of course, I'm going to do it. I'll get well quickly and work hard again. I worked hard to get into this company. I'm still going to rise to the top. Her competitive spirit came out in her face. Just like her dazzling student days, she's still shining now. The surgery was a success, and the pathology report indicated the cancer could be completely removed, with low malignancy and low risk of metastasis. At her request, genetic testing was done, which showed no genetic risk for cancer. Both she and I were relieved. During her hospitalization, we talked every day, and the distance between us seemed to have closed. I enjoyed the time I spent talking to her outside my working hours. Bring me a drink in the afternoon. I'd like something sweet tomorrow she started making demands, and I found her making these small promises adorable. I'm sure I wasn't the only one who found our talks enjoyable. On the day of her discharge, I had prepared flowers for her. As we were leaving the hospital, I handed her the bouquet. Congratulations on your discharge. She looked at the bouquet, then turned her face away with a pout. Can't you see? My hands are full. I can't carry any more. Oh, right. Interpreting her response as a refusal to accept, I felt a bit disheartened. Because I can't carry it, bring it to my house. Huh. I was still processing what Amanda had just said and stared at her blankly. What did you just say? That's what I said. Since I can't carry it, you bring the flowers to my house. Well, Amanda, I don't know where your house is. She then placed a piece of paper with something written on it in my pocket. I reached into my pocket and felt the paper. What's written here? When I asked, she replied, my contact and address. You need to bring flowers. Call me after work. It seems that Amanda is willing to see me outside the hospital. I clenched the piece of paper in my hand. I was hesitant about whether I could really keep this in my pocket just like this. While thinking about what to do, I looked at Amanda who was standing in front of me. She was there, her cheeks turning red, her eyes moist as she looked at me. Surely, she had made up her mind to be here with me. If that's the case, I'd like to respond to her wishes, too. After all, I feel the same way about her. That's why I firmly pushed the paper into the depth of my pocket. Even if you ask for this back, I won't return it. 
Hearing my words, she seemed to relax. Perhaps she had been tense as well. I'll probably never forget the joy on her face at that moment for the rest of my life. When I returned to the office and looked at the note, it was written, Absolutely, you contact me, along with her contact information. I smiled at her characteristic way of making a request. In the evening of that day, after finishing my work, I quickly contacted her and rushed to her house to deliver the bouquet. I hadn't run like that in years. Now, two years later, I live with my wife, Amanda. We do fight a lot, but my wife, who still looks pretty and cute when she's mad, makes me happy. All in all, I want to continue cherishing my wife, with both sweet and cool faces, who never fails to pack me a lunch filled with love.